It gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce this first panel session of the RLUK conference, where we're going to be looking at libraries as partners in research. I am enormously grateful to Amina because I think already we saw in the presentation this morning some really great examples of how partners, particularly the National Library of Scotland, are partnering and developing partnering opportunities for researchers and some really interesting examples um, highlighted in her presentation. And I think it should, gives us a really good, um, a good grounding for our session, which we're going to go on to today. And I think those of you who've worked in libraries for some time, they'll be aware of that whole question of how we partner with researchers is something which has changed. I can go back long enough to remember the days of the, the scholar librarian and that person we employed to actually do research decades back. And it's interesting to see now how we're beginning to rethink in the very different landscape and environment we're in as to how we can be that partner to research and help to develop those research partnerships. Those of us who've been working within the RLUK space will know that RLUK have been looking very closely at this issue, and that's both helping us to think about it, but also putting some practical examples on the ground to support it through funding, through working with partner organisations in the UK to help, um, help libraries to think and support this whole area as libraries, as partners in research. And today, I think I'm looking forward to hearing a variety of, um, of presentations which will look at this issue, will help us to understand this, what the opportunities are a little bit more deeply. To invite our first presenter, Emily Roper, who's research facilitator at Cambridge University Library to give her talk. And the title of her talk is going to be Research Collaboration at Cambridge University Libraries, Partnerships, Pioneers and Pitfalls. And um, we've asked Emily to speak because Cambridge University Library has a growing portfolio of research projects of different sizes. And this paper will consider how investment in research facilitation has contributed to the growth of this portfolio. So Emily, over to you. And I can confirm your slides are looking beautiful on screen. So thank you. Excellent, thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today and to open this session on libraries as partners in research. When I was preparing this proposal last November, I realised that it was almost exactly two years since I had started as research facilitator at Cambridge University Libraries. This prompted me to reflect. I was attracted to the role because it was an unusual one. I'd come across research facilitation in university research offices and in independent research organisations, and I was already doing a similar job at the British Library, but I'd never seen anything of this kind embedded in a university library. Why have this post, as far as I can tell, a pioneering one in a UK university library setting, been created? Maybe you are also wondering the same thing. Today, I will consider how this area of work has evolved in Cambridge University Libraries to produce a growing portfolio of collaborative research projects. I will begin by providing some context on what research collaboration is and how a research facilitator supports this area of activity. Then I will hopefully bring the theory to life by discussing three case studies. And finally, I will offer some reflections that will connect research in libraries with the broader conference theme of mapping the new open. To get us started, I will explore what I mean by research collaboration, or to put it another way, collaborative research. By research collaboration, I mean a research project that can only be undertaken with involvement from library staff that goes above and beyond the standard range of reading room and inquiry and other services. It is a project where an extra level of intervention or input is needed, drawing on library expertise in a sustained way and often, but not exclusively, relating to the collections. Partnerships lie at the heart of collaborative research. Even for a fellowship involving just one individual, an application to a research funder normally involves at least some element of collaborative working. Partnerships rest on the pursuit of a common goal, 
normally a research question or a collection or technical development of shared interest. And research collaborations involve funding, be that from existing budgets within the library or external sources. In my role, I deal mainly with applications to research funders, ranging from as little as a thousand pounds to multi-million pound bids. A research facilitator can contribute to all of these areas. They help to build the partnerships needed to bring the project to fruition. They advise on the nuts and bolts of the application process, and they support the research lead to ensure all partners are working towards shared objectives. Cambridge's research portfolio illustrates the scope of this activity. As you can see from the chart on the left, this currently comprises 22 projects, with a current further five waiting to start, nine submitted to funders for assessment, and 12 in preparation. The table of the right hopefully gives you a flavour of the breadth of these projects. Some, such as Arabic poetry in the Kairagonisa and the Darwin correspondence, are part of the University Library's two embedded research units. Others, such as IGI in primary care and the African Poetry Digital Portal, involve staff in our faculty and departmental libraries. Some, such as Gerard Revealed, are firm, firmly rooted in the collections, whilst others, such as Digital Approaches to Watermarks and the Archive of Tomorrow, involve technical expertise alongside collections. We play a variety of roles in research projects. Currently, we lead four, are co-investigator on seven, project partner on six, and have a smaller role, such as an advisory board member, on five. Together, the projects that we are currently involved with have attracted a funding of just over £9 million, with £1.6 million of that coming to the University of Cambridge, and about £600,000 of that to the university libraries. Current and historic projects have involved a range of partners, both in the UK and further afield. In addition, it's worth noting that, even when applications are unsuccessful, the partnerships that are built during the application process are often, often go on to be used in other contexts. Strategic support lies at the heart of building a research portfolio. A portfolio can only develop if there is high level commitment to involvement in research and to providing the resources needed to support it. I've also noted some other elements that I think are important when building a research portfolio. Funding streams like Towards a National Collection have highlighted the role of the GLAM sector in collections-based research. And certainly, collections form the basis of a lot of our collaborative research projects. But it's important to note that staff expertise is vital too, and that this expertise is not always directly related to the collections. It can be technical expertise, for example, imaging or software development, or expertise relating to conservation. Research facilitation skills are also key. A research facilitator will guide library staff and other partners in shaping an idea into a competitive application and assist with project management and reporting once funding is awarded. Another essential building block is an accurate costing tool. Costing can be complicated especially when trying to factor inflation and salary increments into a multi-year project. Equally important are governance and record keeping. You need robust governance so that the applications you are submitting are the competitive ones that align with your strategic priorities and where everyone who would be involved in delivering the project has been consulted and is happy with what has been agreed. Record keeping sits alongside governance. You need a central place where you store information about applications, 
and record any annoyances that may sit outside the application itself. And last but by no means least, project management skills come in handy not just in terms of managing projects, but the application process as well. We will now see these building blocks in action in the context of three different research projects. The first is the Cambridge Heritage Science Hub, Cherish, a consortium of five departments, including the library, which was awarded three million pounds from the AHRC for heritage science equipment and refurbishment of associated spaces. Just over £700,000 of the award came to the library, which we used for state-of-the-art imaging equipment, digital storage and refurbishment of the digital content unit. That's our imaging department. And the photo here shows the installation of our new Megavision multispectral imaging system. So what did we learn from our involvement with this project? Well, above all, we learned that undertaking a three million pound project in seven months at the height of a global pandemic is very challenging. It was challenging for us personally and professionally. And these challenges were compounded by our dependence on external suppliers and other university departments for project delivery, who were also facing stresses and strains. What was particularly interesting about this application was the consortium approach we took. Although this was challenging in some respects, working with other areas of the university enabled us to produce a more competitive application and ultimately to deliver a much more innovative project than we could have done alone. It's also worth noting that our ability to apply as a consortium was enabled by university seed funding. This meant that the five partners had been able to work together before the call was launched, so we were not starting completely from scratch. In addition, now that the project is complete and we've had a little bit of time to reflect, we are finding that the ongoing benefits are as much about the stronger partnerships and joint ways of working that we have developed as the actual equipment. I'm now going to turn to the second case study, the Stern Digital Library, a project in which we were a project partner. I've picked this one because I think our involvement here is fairly typical of a university library with special collections. We provided curatorial advice on Lawrence Stern items in our collection as an in-kind contribution, and the project provided funding for digitization. By working in partnership, we were able to generate new knowledge on our collections, as well as obtaining additional digitized content. It's also worth noting a few practical points that underpinned this partnership and made it work for us. This is, this, the first is that the cost of digitization was included in the project budget. There is sometimes a misconception that as a project partner, you cannot draw on the project budget. This is not the case. Although some in-kind contributions are expected, you can include minor directly incurred costs, that is costs that you incur directly from the activities of the project. In this case, the digitization. Secondly, when you are a project partner, although you may have a smaller role in the, in the project overall, it's always a good idea to spec out your contributions and try to put figures to everything, including anything that you might be doing in kind. This really helps to bring clarity to what you are committing to and will help if a letter of support is required. And thirdly, one thing that can be challenging is that the AHRC generally only funds 80% of the full economic cost. So in other words, 80% of what you ask for in your application. So for example, if you've costed in a thousand pounds for digitization, the AHR will award you 800 pounds. This obviously can leave you with a shortfall and there are a variety of ways of dealing with this. Too long-winded to go into now, but it's worth being aware of this potential pitfall. 
And last, but by no means least, Curious Cures. This is a two year Cambridge led project on medieval medical recipes that we are due to start next month. It has been made possible thanks to half a million pounds worth of funding from the Wellcome's now unfortunately defunct Research Resources in the Humanities and Social Science Scheme. This was one of the few schemes that you could actually apply to for cataloguing, conservation and digitization support. So it's a great shame um, that it's now closed. As we haven't started the research yet, our learning so far on Curious Cures centres around the process of applying and setting up the project. I think the most important thing that we learned from the application process is not to be put off by an unsuccessful application. We were rejected the first time around and it was only on our second attempt that we succeeded. We were able to get feedback from the funder. This isn't always the case for all schemes and from all funders, but fortunately, this particular, particular welcome scheme did offer feedback. And we didn't hesitate to follow up on this and to carry on asking questions as they arose. Typically, funding schemes have success rates of between one in seven and one in 10. So unfortunately, rejection of very competitive and worthwhile applications is common. However, applications often improve at the second or third attempt, as time can help you to articulate the research questions more clearly and understand what is important or unique about your project. The other thing that is worth, worth sharing, I think, is the sheer amount of time that it can take to craft a competitive application of this scale. I would suggest it can take at least six months bearing in mind that staff are unlikely to be able to work on it full time. Also, creating a budget for any research project, but especially one of this size, can be quite complex. Using a professional costing tool, or failing that, working closely with your finance team is therefore really important. The other thing that's worth bearing in mind is that, unlike the AHRC, Welcome fund 100% of the budget you request. However, it slightly swings in roundabouts in that respect, because unlike the AHRC and UKRY more widely, they do not pay overheads. So recovery on a full economic costing basis is not possible. So it's important to go into ap any applications with an awareness of this. And finally, this project involves recruiting five new posts. This is time consuming, especially if HR teams are not used to roles linked to research funding. And it's something that's really important to factor in when planning the start date. So having looked at those three case studies, I'd now like to conclude with some broader reflections. Alongside the challenges, some of which we've covered here and others of which may be teased out in the questions. I hope this presentation has demonstrated that well-managed research collaborations can bring many benefits to libraries. New knowledge on the collections, capitalizing on the skills and knowledge of library staff, diversifying income streams and benefiting from external expertise, technology and perspectives to name but a few. But research collaboration also touches on questions relating to skills, space and openness that are fundamental to the running of libraries and all of which are coming up as themes later in the conference. With this in mind, my challenge to you, both as the conference proceeds and when you return to your libraries, is to consider how research collaboration may weave into and inform these broader areas of professional practice. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Emily. Um, obviously hugely grateful to you for your presentation and it's great to have that insight, that really practical insight and in what it means to take on a range of projects with your examples there. 
<clears throat> I think it comes through also interestingly already um, that whole point about partnership and the importance of partnership within your institution as well as those wider partnerships outside and how important they are both to allow us to develop new skills but also for our research bits to be successful. And although clearly also I could see it came through that doing this kind of work is challenging, there are, as you say at the end, some real rewards there for us to, 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 to get the, make the most of. So thank you. Colleagues, if you do have questions, just a reminder, please do post those in the Q&A spot. And you can post those at any time uh, before we, we, and actually during the panel session as well. But uh, if, you can, if I can encourage you to start putting those in, that would be, I'd be very grateful for that. Okay, if we could then move on to our second presentation, and that's going to be given by Sophie Fourcadel, who's librarian in charge of open science at Sciences Po Library, and Helen Porter, research support manager at the LSE. And the title of their talk is The Role of Libraries in European Universities, The Case of Open Science Development in the Civica Alliance. So a number of us are involved in uh, the European alliances, including the University of Edinburgh, and we know that it does provide a really great space for cooperation, collaboration, and some interesting opportunities for, for libraries. So this presentation is going to look about how the, they can be a fertile ground for cooperation with libraries and scientific communities. And it's going to explore some of the challenges involved in working with a community of eight uh, universities from across Europe. So Sophie, I guess you're going to speak first. Uh, so please. Uh, take away your presentation. Thank you. Thank you and hello uh, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Thank you for inviting us uh, to the conference. So my name is Sophie Forcadel and I work at the Sciences Po Library uh, in Paris and with Helen Porter from the LSE Library. We are going to present the work we are currently doing with the um, Civica European Alliance project and specifically within the Civica Research Project. As far as I am concerned, I also work with a colleague in Paris uh, in, at Sciences Po Library, Cécile Touitou. So um, our presentation is about the role of librarians on open science and as part of this European uh, University Project. So as a reminder, European universities, as you already uh, told, are transnational alliances of higher education institutions from across the EU that joined forces with the financial support of the Erasmus+, Plus, Horizon 2020, and Horizon Europe programs. So they aim to enhance the quality, the inclusion, and the attractiveness of European higher uh, education. So currently, 41 alliances have been established involving almost 300 European institutions. And as you can see on the slide, there are eight founding partners of this Civica Alliance and two new universities from Spain and Poland are likely to join the alliance within a year. So Civica has Erasmus Plus funding until September 2022 and is currently applying for for further funding until 2028. In addition, and to strengthen the research activity, a Horizon 2020 funding has been added for a period of three years, so from 2021 to 2023, and this is the Civica Research Project. So uh, very quickly, overall, the Civica Alliance now represents uh, 50,000 students and 10,000 <laughs> Uh, academics, like many alliances, four major themes co uh, constitute the pillars of the university, and the pillars drive both joint courses and collaborative research activities. So the Civica Research uh, Project aims to lay the foundations for a collective and concerted vision of research activities within the Alliance. It consists of seven work packages and libraries are actually involved in two of them, the WP3 and WP4. So we will talk specifically about WP4 uh, dedicated to open science because it has been initiated by the libraries 
and it is led by the libraries. So this uh, WP4 aims again to lay the foundations for the principles of openness in research within Civica and to effectively promote this cultural change. So the cultural change is really our key word there. And it is um, a question of community building, of course, uh, which is of primary importance, but not only. Um, so now, um, maybe more specifically, we are working on a network of open science reference and we are working on, to build a community, but we are also working uh, on the specificities of civic as disciplines in social sciences and their impact on open practices, especially data. We uh, are uh, going to work on the indicators showing the openness of the results of the research carried out uh, within the Alliance and their possible inclusion in the evaluation of the researchers. And finally, we are trying to have a pooled training activity for researchers, specifically young researchers, and which would also be as inclusive as possible, for example, by including the support staff among which libraries, of course. So libraries are therefore key partners in the implementation of the whole um, work package. However, it soon became clear to us that the uh, working groups uh, we created at the beginning of the project needed to be extended and hybridized with the other research related professions. So not only the libraries, so a big part of our work is, as I told before, to build this inclusive community. So to do this, we have identified an initial list of 24 open science contact points among our partners. But it turned out that, as you can see, uh, the librarians are again in the majority. So we have put this uh, hype, uh, this community and hopefully hybrid community into uh, the whole process of this cultural change. So we really need to create this community because it is the one of the drivers for cultural change, as you can see on this pyramid. So by the way, this pyramid was uh, created by Brian Nosek, professor of psychology at the University of Virginia. And he is also the director of the COS, Center for Open Science. So uh, at first, uh, this pyramid shows that cultural change is, well, I, I mean, difficult to implement, of course, and that the communities uh, play a significant role in the process, but not only. It also shows that even if you know that individuals, that researchers are motivated to apply a common vision on open science, and of course has have the ability to be open and have their research reproducible and so on, it is not sufficient to succeed. So we really, as librarians and as leaders of uh, this work package, we really need to pursue a comprehensive change strategy. And this requires uh, these five levels of intervention represented by this pyramid. So these levels are uh, progressive. They reflect the fact also that successful implementation of higher levels depend on successful implementation of lower levels. So infrastructure is the base of the pyramid, making behavior change possible. And then there are the user interfaces and experiences which need to be easy and integrate with researchers existing work flows, of course. Then there are the communities themselves, which work to increase the uptake of open science practices. So they have to meet uh, with each other, they have to pass on the information about uh, on their own networks, and so on. And then comes the 
incentives and the policies which need to be aligned. So to start uh, on a common vision of uh, our cultural change, we organized two events, a webinar and a specific meeting. Maybe um, uh, Helen can uh, talk about that uh, later on. So now regarding uh, the policy and also the infrastructure levels, so the top um, and the, the first level, uh, we have initiated a barometer to measure the commitment to open science among each partners. So the aim uh, was to see how well equipped the partners were in terms of infrastructure and institutional or national support at the beginning of the project, and then to reconduct, to rerun twice this barometer during and at the end of the project to see the evolution uh, on, on this pyramid. So the first responses show an average and uh, evolving level. Uh, I won't go into details uh, here, uh, but we added a slide with the overall results of this first round. But um, what is important is that in the, next, in the next round, we will add reflective questions on the changes observed between the two rounds. So on this cultural change process, and in particular, we will ask what barriers and obstacles have been identified that would have prevented progress on certain items regarding these uh, infrastructures, tools, policies, and so on, because barriers can arise at a national, at an international, or institutional level. So we will also address the issue of needs to overcome the difficulties identified. So these are basically all the levels of intervention, intervention for us um, libraries. And I will now hand over to Helen for more maybe technical details. Uh, thank you, Sophie. <clears throat> So Sophie's spoken about two of the project de deliverables, which are well underway. Um, for the remainder of the project, we are now moving on to tasks relating to data interoperability, open science indicators and training of researchers, particularly young researchers. However, I wanted to step back a little bit and look at open science principles and the overall approach we wanted to take on this project. The team who designed the project plan had identified important areas of work However, as a collaborative team looking at open science from various perspectives, we soon identified we needed something overarching to bring this all together and ensure the various work was cohesive. As you will be aware, several principles already exist from the European Commission, funders and institutions, and a set of principles seems a sensible way to go. Our regular meetings that included all colleagues across the eight Civica institutions um, working on open science was the place that we have been working on these um, issues. So key debates have included, do existing principles work for the social sciences? How can a set of principles work across institutions with very different levels of engagement um, with open science? and also different national frameworks. Um, how can the principles be flexible enough for institutions to engage with them without conflicting with e existing policies? Um, we're still finalizing these principles, but a key approach has already emerged that for Civica at this stage, um, the principles should focus on the activities and needs for of the social science researchers rather than wider institutional structures and policies. Um, although we still recognize these are um, important and still fall within our work. The three priority areas identified are open access publishing, open data and citizen science or participatory research. Um, Sophie, could you move on to the next slide, please? <laughs> Thank you. Um, we hope that this overarching approach and the principles identified will enable us to start to point towards that co cultural change that Sophie's already mentioned in the social science across civic institutions, as the common thread at our institutions is our specialisation in social sciences. Um, Professor Patrick Dunleavy, Editor-in-Chief of LSE Press, is a co-leader on some of the open science deliverables and is particularly interested in the gaps in skills and guidance for qualitative researchers. 
Civic has also built in plans to look very closely at disciplinary opportunities and, and challenges in open science across the breadth of social sciences offered at our institutions. Um, although Civica Research is a project centered around research support and infrastructure, Civica has also funded a set of research projects being run by academics across the eight institutions based on the themes that Sophie um, mentioned before. Um, so this gives an opportunity to really partner and consult with those projects, test our ideas and the work that we have produced, as well as undertake our own investigations relating to open science on those projects. And we very much hope that the project outputs will provide something new and we are reviewing existing research and guidance to ensure we don't reinvent the wheel. Our initial findings will be published as project reports over the next 21 months or so. We also hope to build on these reports with the open access publication of a dedicated handbook for open science for the social sciences. One of our key deliverables involves experimenting and designing training in open science for social sciences, um, scientists, sorry, especially young researchers. Co colleagues are currently doing an audit of existing training across in civic institutions and elsewhere. And again, we hope to present something new, very practical training materials that equip researchers with the skills to build open science into their research practices. So again, speaking to that ambition to start to um, affect cultural change. Um, much of the work, um, if you go on to the next slide, Sophie, um, much of Oh, okay, that's a different slide. So I can, uh, much of the work we've been doing um, has been exploratory, exploratory, and we're aware there are limits to the amount we can achieve across eight institutions in such a short, short space of time. However, as Sophie mentioned, Civica is already planning further funding applications and project design into which the work that we're doing is being built. So we very much hope our work on open science can continue um, in the Civica. Um, there's lots of information about Civica and its various projects on the website and social media platforms, and we already have an open science event on the Civica YouTube channel. Um, so we'll be posting more about our open science work um, as the project develops um, on this Civica resources. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sophie and Helen. It's really good to, in the context of research partnerships, to hear about this important area where we as libraries can clearly get involved, can partner, can lead, uh, and can help shape the, the agenda in this space. So it's good to hear your experience around about that. So thank you for that. <clears throat> I'm sure your, your presentation will generate a lot of questions around about that. So thank you. Okay, our final presentation is going to be given by Phil Cheeseman, Associate Director of Academic Services at Lancaster University, and Thomas Shaw, Associate Director of Digital Innovation and Research Services, also from Lancaster. And they're going to be looking at the issue of Lancaster. Well, the title of their talk is Lancaster Digital Collections, Making Our Library Vision a Reality. And they're going to explore in the presentation uh, the Lancaster University's development and future plans for Lancaster Digital Collections, particularly in the context of their new strategy. So Phil and Thomas, over to you. Thank you. Um, so we're going to talk today about our work with Lancaster Digital Collections and how this is an example of making our library vision, the library towards 2025, a reality. So firstly, uh, we'd just like to introduce um, Lancaster University. So we're a, a medium sized research intensive university in the northwest of England, and uh, we're part of the N8 group of research intensive universities. And as a library, we, we really thrive on challenging traditional notions of what a library is uh, and what a library does, going beyond providing just a service uh, and beyond thinking about the library just in terms of books and the building. And developing partnerships and collaborations beyond the library is a, a really key part of our, our DNA. And you can, you can see this ethos illustrated uh, on the screen here um, with some of the perhaps the more playful activities uh, that have taken place recently in the library space. So um, in the top right, that's the, the Traces Art Workshop with university cleaning staff. The bottom right is a, a mending station session um, with Sewing Cafe Lancaster, one of our community projects. And then bottom left, that's our library director, Andrew Barker. And yes, he really is playing records in the library. Uh, and I'm, I'm guessing that's something you probably not usually associate with a, a library or indeed with a library director for, for that matter. 
So as a library uh, in 2020, we, we started work on a new vision, the library towards 2025, uh, and that was launched in April 2021. And it's a, a vision that seeks to, to capture and articulate our ethos and ambition that I've just described. We took a deliberately collaborative approach to this, and we, we didn't want to just lock ourselves away in a room and, and write what we thought uh, the library should be and do. Um, we worked with stakeholders across the institution to really combine their voice uh, and our voice together. And we used a variety of innovative approaches to do this, um, such as provocations. And, and these were a range of deliberately provocative statements. So, for example, um, the library should get rid of all of its print books. Um, so these are not necessarily things we would actually do, of course, or, or, or do to their, their full extent. Um, but they were very much designed to start a conversation, to, to be provocative and to, to really to push at the limits of, of what people think a library is. And a real headline emerged out of that work. Uh, we connect, we innovate, we include. And that headline is articulated across the five themes that you can see on the screen uh, and which Phil will explore later in the presentation. So alongside developing the vision, uh, at the same time, we started a major initiative to develop Lancaster Digital Collections, uh, a platform for hosting high quality image collections. Lancaster Digital Collections, or, or LDC for short, is our instance of the Cambridge Digital Library Platform, which has been developed by the University of Cambridge since 2010. The University of Manchester worked with Cambridge to develop Manchester Digital Collections, which was launched in January 2020. And we're now the third institution to join, and, and we launched Lancaster Digital Collections in September 2021. And we really see this as it's a true partnership with Cambridge, and we, we work with them on a collaborative project at the outset to containerize the code base for the, the platform. And this was a really significant step towards it now being uh, fully open source. So we could have just built, uh, of course, our own platform in-house. We could have just done our own thing. But we, we really saw the benefits of working in collaboration with Cambridge and with Manchester and developing really strong relationships with them. And we hope um, that that will happen with other institutions, too, as part of the recently launched Cambridge Digital Collections Platform Consortium. So we launched um, the LDC with five collections initially. Um, firstly, the Satterthwaite letter books, the John Welch letters and the Glass Lantern Slides collection. Uh, and these are all collections from the local region which are held in our library special collections. Alongside those collections are the outputs from an AHRC funded project entitled Cinema Memory and the Digital Archive. And these are digitised outputs about the experience of cinema going in the 1930s. And then we have perhaps my personal favourite. Um, we have a vast collection of, of really beautiful Edwardian postcards curated by a professor of literacy studies at Lancaster University. In addition to these, um, we also have a really exciting pipeline of new collections coming in, uh, including an AHRC funded citizen science project to transcribe the notebooks of the 19th century chemist Humphrey Davy. And that's a, a really significant national collection held at the, the Royal Institution. And we also have in the pipeline a British Academy and Leverhulme Trust project uh, exploring the historic Ordnance Survey name books from the, uh, from the local region. And we have um, a range of really bold ambitions for how we want the LDC to develop in the future. Um, although it has a really central role as an image platform, we want to go uh, beyond it just being that. And the, the LDC will help us to enable research. It will really enhance the library's role as a partner across the research lifecycle, hosting content that is open and inclusive and, and really helping to drive public engagement and impact with, with that research. And these are some of our key future developments. Um, so firstly, integrating the OMS or Oral History Metadata Synchronizer player into the platform to play audio content with dynamic synced transcriptions. We also want to make the LDC a laboratory for primary research and digital scholarship through text and data mining approaches. And we're already exploring this with a reader in linguistics at, at Lancaster, who's piloting the Satterthwaite letter books for corpus linguistic approaches. 
The Humphrey David project is already using the citizen science platform Zooniverse to crowdsource transcriptions. And it's early days for this, but we'd we'd really love to be able to import Zooniverse data directly into the platform for analysis and preparation. And again, uh, really help to make the LDC a tool for primary research. And we don't just see the LDC as a standalone platform. Its, its real potential will come alive when it's integrated into the wider digital research and innovation ecosystem through, for instance, integration with Zooniverse, uh, with the digital preservation system, and integration with other instances of the platform at other institutions to create uh, an interconnected network of, of scholarship. And finally, and uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, we really see the LDC as the basis for ambitious partnerships beyond Lancaster University. And this is a theme which Phil is going to go on and explore further. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Phil uh, and he's going to examine this work further through the lens of our library vision. Uh, thanks, Tom. Um, and uh, apologies for not being able to come on screen earlier. Uh, my screen took just the wrong moment to freeze for me. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit about how LDC, uh, like Lancaster Digital Collections, connects with our vision. So just first of all, returning to our library vision, um, the uh, five themes that you, you see here uh, really outline our, our ambitions and, and commitments um, as a library. Uh, and when developing them, it was really important for us that we didn't just uh, describe what we do, but also the kind of library we would be and the behaviours we would demonstrate. Uh, and to operationalise that, we've mapped all of um, our forthcoming priorities against the five themes in our vision, uh, developing a five-year roadmap that you can see on the, on the right-hand side here. Uh, with uh, some 20, uh, 29 vision outcomes of which Lancaster Digital, Digital Collections is just one. So looking at the, the first of our themes, uh, which is uh, on digital and physical libraries, our vision is very much to position the library so there's no separation between digital and physical environments and in, uh, inhabit and, and engage across both spaces. It's very much our ambition for digital collections as well. Uh, and the public launch of LDC coincided with a two day library festival that we held uh, in September last year to celebrate the opening of our new extension and showcase some of the creative spaces it, it holds. Uh, now, at that time, many staff were on the cusp of transition from home working to getting back onto campus. Some restrictions were still in place and there was lots of conversation about hybrid approaches. So we were able to lead the way and demonstrate the power of, a tr of truly blending the digital and physical environments, extending our reach and providing a truly inclusive experience. The Saturday evening event uh, that was our showcase stream was streamed over YouTube and has had some 67,000 views. And for Lancaster Digital Collections, this meant we were able to showcase the digital collections alongside a physical exhibition in, in our new space and to launch the event where presenters and audience participated either in person or online. And I think we, had, we even had a, a member of the uh, uh, one of the presenters present from uh, from Greece. Uh, so our second theme talks to the role we play as a library connecting with others and bringing communities together. Tom's already outlined uh, the benefits of our partnership with Cambridge and Manchester during the implementation of LDC and our commitment to the consortium that will drive future development. Equally important for us were the partnerships we developed with our research communities and others, groups such as Lancaster Digital Humanities Hub. Our work with them not only established the initial collections, but also led to some early opportunities for engagement. And just one example illustrated in this slide, uh, we used the, the, Sat or the Satwaite letter books and other library collections were used to support a project to explore the historic role of Lancaster in transatlantic slave trade. This community project led by the Lancaster Black History Group involved us in partnership with academic staff from Lancaster, from the University of Central Lancashire, together with the city museums, local schools, and the Lancaster-based sewing cafe. It culminated in a hybrid conference held in, in, in the library last November. 
So moving on to the theme that sits at the heart of our vision, our third theme is the commitment to equality, diversity and inclusion. For us, this is not just about providing inclusive and supportive spaces and services or opening up our collections. It's about celebrating diversity and recognizing the value it contributes to our distinctiveness. Lancaster Digital Collections democratizes access to the collections beyond those able to travel and see them in person. Our open and inclusive approach to developing new collections will ensure the diversity of the material it holds. The platform is key to realizing our open science ambitions, including facilitating citizen science and allowing the public to be empowered actors of research. Alongside other initiatives, such as introducing community collections and free community cards for public access, LDC contributes to our ambition to be an open library at the heart of all our communities. So our fourth theme talks to the lasting change we'll bring through disruptive innovation. Lancaster Digital Collections has innovation at its heart and is a hub for new research and engagement, public engagement, not simply an image repository. It ensures sustainability of physical artifacts and digital objects for the future. It's also inspired us to think more boldly about the value in our special collections and archives as well as the potential for hosting collections created by others. On this slide, three early examples of innovations in LDC. We're working with an academic colleague to develop a short course where students will create digital editions for a literary extract titled Myow. We're also exploring the use of 3D scanning to open up access for schools to items held in our special collections and archives as well as those in the city museums. And we're continuing our work with the Lancaster Black History Group on the Slavery Family Trees Project to create an augmented reality Lancaster City tour. And our final theme articulates our commitment to act in a global context and at a local level. LDC connect, connects our local communities in the Northwest of England by hosting collections originating locally, including collections owned by other local organizations. Yet it has a global reach opening up opportunities for engagement and partnerships internationally. Working with local communities and groups, we'll continue to develop collections that document the rich culture and heritage of the region, as illustrated in this example from our glass lantern slides collection that you can see on the left. We'll also use LDC as a platform for engaging with global issues such as climate change, environmental impact and sustainability. We're in the early stages of gathering content for an archive of the development of Eden North in Morecambe Bay. So to, in, to, to conclude, in this presentation, we've drawn on just one example, the, the development of Lancaster Digital Collections to illustrate how our vision is transforming the library at Lancaster, helping us to realize our ambitions to be a library at the heart of our communities, local and global, to connect, to innovate and to include. Thank you. Dave, thanks, thanks very much, um, Phil and Tom. I think it was great to have that really important part of our work, the digital space, which clearly provides many opportunities for partnerships. I think it was interesting also that you highlighted that in order to have true partnership, we do need to be very open, but you've clearly been also prepared to take risk. And I think if we want to, to think more widely about how partnerships can develop, that's something we need to consider. So um, very much appreciate your talk. Uh, and it's good to have uh, that aspect of uh, that, those kind of areas of opportunities covered uh, this morning. So I'd now like to invite our presenters to turn back on their, their cameras and uh, open up their mics and we'll move into the panel session to do the, the Q&A. So thank you colleagues for doing that. And that will, so uh, what I'll do first of all is just ask, um, take, I'll take some, some individual questions to you first to warm things up and then we'll move on to, to questions from, from, the, from the audience. So first of all, Amelie, just to ask, obviously 
I picked up and it, the, that your role is probably quite unusual in terms of these roles in libraries at the moment, although, of course, you did mention that you worked at the British Library before. I wonder if you could say a little bit about where you came from and how you transitioned into this role and what kind of skills or changes you felt you had to, to, to make to, to, to make yourself effective in your current role. Yeah, um, so um, I suppose I first became involved um, in research projects sort of on a practical level when I was working as a curator at the British Library and quite by accident um, when I joined, joined the BL as digital music curator, um, one of the things that landed on my plate was working on, on an AHRC funded project, um, which we were a project partner on. So I began to learn about, I suppose, the, the nuts and bolts of how things worked and, and see, the, see the benefits, um, and, but also some of the challenges of working in that way and became sort of re really, really interested in, in, in how you can build, bring together research um, to fulfill st strategic priorities and how you can craft applications to, to really meet the needs of libraries. And then, then fortunately, um, a post came up at the British Library. So I was um, in, in their research development team, which is quite, quite well established, where I was able to kind of get the job because I'd had some practical experience of working on a research project, which had just come about by chance, and, and then sort of learn, learn the craft, the sort of the research craft of the research administration. Um, but I, I think it really does help having a background in libraries because it means that you know where the pinch points might be, you know where the challenges might be when you're putting together applications, which can make a, make a real difference, I think. I mean, would you say there's anything particular, uh, do, yeah, obviously be as open as comfortable you are, but in terms that you found particularly challenging about the you, other things you've really had to say, perhaps pick up from scratch or things which have been a little bit more foreign to you perhaps in some other aspects of the role? Um, I think probably the hardest thing um, is costing um, because costing is so important and costing even when you're not in the, in the budget costing out your in kind contributions. There's so many ways of doing it. There are so many things that you can get wrong. There can be exchange rates, there can be salary increments, there can be inflation. And I think that's the thing that I really had to, had to work at to learn. Um, but we're, we're very fortunate that we have a costing tool that does all, all of that for us now, or does a lot of that for us. You have to apply some common sense to make sure the system's working as it should. But the British Library, we had um, a spreadsheet, and it was much, was much harder to do that than with a proper costing tool. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, so moving on to to Sophie and Helen um, again. Thank you for your talk. <clears throat> I'm very conscious, um, uh, having had some involvement myself with some of our European alliances, that it's been very heavily. A lot of the work has been very fo heavily focused on the academic side and trying to get that library voice to be heard can often be a challenge. I just wondered if you if you could reflect a bit on your. You've clearly done some great work in the open science, but did you get immediate acceptance that you were the people to lead? Were there conversations mm -hmm. you have to have? Are there still areas where you could see you could do more, but there's a bit of a negotiation yet to be had to persuade people that you are able to do that? I don't know which one of you might want to just think reflect on that first. Hello, Helen, do you want to? <laughs> yeah, sure, I can do this time. Yeah, so <clears throat> I came to the Civica project a, li a little bit late, but it was my impression that because this project was very much related on infrastructure research support, that professional services on the whole were very, very well represented. And um, as a result, um, librarians did have um, a lot of presence within the project plan. Um, we've got we've what we found is that um, at some institutions across the alliance, there's different levels of staffing in libraries. So some of us are better staffed than others, and what that means is that some of us have very specific skills, say um, at LSE and Sciences Po, and then in other colleagues at other institutions have only got maybe one or two people that come to the same meetings, and I think it's quite a, a lot of work for them. But also they don't have necessarily developed the services yet, so they can 
can be an imbalance um, across the alliance. But I feel very much that librarians have been um, supported to take the lead on this. And Sophie maybe can add something because I know Sophie's really been um, integral to that from the start of the project design. Okay, thank you. Yes, Sophie. Um, yes, thank you, Helen. I, I totally agree. And as, as um, with this project, uh, we really strive to move forward together. As you said, even if there are disparities, and well, because also we are libraries and we are not in such a competitive, uh, uh, you know, landscape. Um, so even if there are disparities in human resources and equipments, as you just said, we uh, have to avoid thinking in terms of the lowest common denominator, as we say in, in France, but rather in terms of um, collective ambition. And that might uh, be a bit difficult. We do not find it so difficult among uh, and within libraries, but mm -hmm. as soon as you uh, talk with academics, uh, it's another story, of course, because you, there, there is a totally different uh, landscape with totally uh, different uh, yes, uh, well, <laughs> uh, consequences and so on. So, so can you say that, um, that you've, you've, you've seen examples where you've had conversations and you're saying these people on different levels and they, once they've talked to you, you can see them moving up and moving up to a higher level and understanding, yeah, mm -hmm. you see nods. Yeah, great. So what I'd say, that's it's really encouraging to hear that because I know that this whole area is clearly something where we have a lot of opportunity to provide mm. partnership. And again, obviously, I was very grateful that you mentioned you're planning to, to publish a lot of your outputs to make mm. those very public. So I'm sure a lot of us will want to follow that work. So that's fantastic. Um, over to Tom and Phil, and thank you again for, for your presentation. Um, clearly, you are people who like to explore new spaces, which is great but that can sometimes come with a little bit of, of a sense that people think that you, you may be moving into spaces either that you possibly shouldn't go into or they feel that there's a degree of ownership which is there already. I wonder if you've had any of those challenges and again, just to reflect on, on that kind of experience. Then which one of you wants to have um, a go first? I'll, I'll start Thanks, first Phil. and Tom, uh, you do, do come in. Um, so, so yeah, um, I guess it's something very, we're very conscious of uh, and, and it was some, uh, I, I think it very much influenced the, our approach to the work we did around our vision uh, to start with. So, so we began really by, uh, well, we, we undertook a sort of 360 uh, analysis um, where we looked at our own perceptions of where the library was placed alongside those of, of, um, of people right across the institution. Um, and, and that then led to sort of that collaborative development that, that meant that we were partners from the beginning before we'd sort of set where the library was, was positioning itself for the future, um, which made it that much easier then to continue the conversation on. So I, th I think that was at the starting point of it. Um, it's, I think we, we have to acknowledge very much that we're in an experimenting phase. Um, so we are trying lots of new things, uh, but they're always um, instigated, or, or they're, not, they're always instigated with others, if not by others. Um, so that there's always that partnership from the outset. And I think we've, we've put, put down a line that basically says, we'll try anything that, that feels right, provided we've got someone to partner with, and, and ideally more than one group to partner with, so that we're bringing people together. Thank you. Tom, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I, I agree entirely with, with all of that. And I think, as, as Phil said, I, I think the, the key thing is, uh, you know, about approaching these as partnerships, as, as collaborations, so that it's, it's not about the library. Um, you know, trying to establish an empire that kind of ventures into into other areas. It's it's much more about the uh, you know the the expertise and the value that we can bring through those those partnerships and uh, and the way that we, we connect up with other people to to do that. And um, certainly at Lancaster, I think the uh, you know the response to, to to all of this of the you know the library moving into new and unexpected areas has been overwhelmingly positive uh, from from the wider institution. Um, perhaps a little bit of surprise sometimes that you know as a library that we're you know really interested in moving into these areas um, but certainly the response has been uh, you know overwhelmingly a, a positive one. And I think just to follow up on that um, 
I mean, we've been having some interesting conversations locally about the how people perceive the concept of library. And again, it was interesting to talk this the talk this morning, clearly saying as an idea, it remains very strong. But what people think that idea we find can sometimes be a barrier. And I can hear you're a very, you know, I can see lots of nods, which is, I, I'm kind of hoping you're going to tell me actually you've begun to be able to change that. And I'll open this to everybody because you're all working in quite what might be described as slightly new or innovative spaces for libraries. Have you begun to see mindsets changing, thinking, okay, library perhaps is something a bit different from what I remember 10, 15, 20 years ago? Again, Tom, perhaps because you last, do you want to come in first and then I'll invite others to comment? Sure, I, I think we've, uh, I think we've seen that to a huge extent. I think, uh, you know, the the way in which, uh, you know, for, for instance, uh, researchers will reach out to us now around areas like research data in a, in a way uh, where even just a few years ago, um, they probably wouldn't have made that connection uh, so readily between, uh, you know, that, that field and, and the library. Uh, you know, I think things have, uh, you know, certainly over the last decade um, have, have, have you know, there's been a real kind of transformation, uh, I think, in the way in which, uh, you know, our users and our partners think about and conceive of, of the library. Um, still a lot more to do, of course. And, um, you know, I think as, uh, you know, as Phil and I talked about in the in the presentation, that sense of the vision being, um, you know, both our voice and their voice combined. I think that's the, the really powerful thing where it's not it's not just on the one hand us going out and, you know, saying, you know, and, and kind of talking about what the library should be without engaging with others. And equally, it's not about us just asking people what they want from the library and kind of, um, you know, in a more transactional way, just doing whatever we're, we're asked to do. It's, you know, something much more powerful than that, where you bring our, our knowledge and our expertise and the voice of our users as well to, to, you know, to push and shift and, and push the limits of, of what people think a library is. Helen, I could see you nodding there as well. Did you, did you want to add? Um, yeah, we, our, um, our, uh, all of our project deliverables include, I think, researchers. Um, and it's been quite interesting to see that um, I think there's a perception that's been that, that mm. researchers are very much the experts in a, a particular domain and that the library may not have as much to offer. Um, I don't know if Emily will see this, but then when, when we've shown what we have got to offer in the, in the areas of open science research data management, there's been a real shift in opinion and approach to the library. And I think academics have really valued how much knowledge, experience, skills, resources that we can bring there. So that's been a really um, pleasing result of being involved in this project, um, I think. Um, yeah, I don't know if Sophie, you want to add anything about that. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Emily, you were, again, you were also nodding when, when I asked the initial question. Yeah, I, I think we're making really good progress in um, traditional academics, I suppose you might say, so it's the lecturers and, and so on across the university, understanding what the library can bring to research projects um, beyond the kind of services that they walk in and, and they see some mm. deep collaborations that I would I was talking about I think where we've still got to do more work at, at least in Cambridge is with our own central research office who often are still quite puzzled to see library staff being um, included as co-investigators mm -hmm. and still sometimes get confused and think well the library's already included in this application because we're, we're adding overheads to certain posts and that's the library that's the service and the more applications that we put in, um, the, the more those perceptions are beginning to change. And things like the RLUK Professional Practice Fellowship Scheme, which is specifically to enable um, staff to lead a small research project, that's really helping us to, to challenge those perceptions, but there is still work to do there. Okay, thank you. It's a very... I was smiling. It's a very familiar story, uh, the one you're telling about um, some of the conversations we've had with colleagues in research offices. So, but it is possible to make progress. OK, so to move over to some of the questions from, from the, the audience. So first of all, a question from Samuel Bellow around about funding. I think this is for Amelie. Uh, I think you, you referenced quite a lot of UK uh, funding opportunities. And I think it's just suggesting, are there, have you come across wider opportunities which you've been able to make use of? Yeah, um, so it's it's worth saying um, that so the, ma the major funders that we apply to are the UKRI ones, so including the AHRC, 
and they have to be led by a UK partner, but you can cost in international um, collaborators, they're, they're called, but they can be co-investigators um, or re researchers. So it is possible, and we are still able to apply to the um, various EU schemes as well. So there's, there's definitely, um, it, it, it's definitely possible. What I would say with the, the EU schemes, um, what I'm finding, um, I think, is that people are beginning to think when a project is, is, is being led by, say, Germany or Belgium or some, somewhere like that, they're beginning to hesitate a bit more about UK partners um, because of, of, of perceived and, and some real barriers. Um, so it, it, it's getting a bit harder to build those partnerships, but it, it is all technically still possible. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, Helen and Sophie, so there's been a couple of questions from Hope Willard round about your self-assessment questionnaire and audit. So first, first part of the question is, will all project partners take the self-assessment questionnaire at the same time? And how did you design it? And then I think tied to that, then there's a question about audit or auditing the, the work which has been done. So auditing develop training for mid-career or senior researchers who started before um, open science appeared. Mm -hmm. And I can, I, I can feel where that question is coming from. But so maybe those two parts, would you like to, to, to answer those for us, please? Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, as for the self-assessment questionnaire, uh, yes, uh, all project partners took the questionnaire at the same time for the first round, that was the last summer. And how, how was the self-assessment uh, questionnaire designed? Uh, it was adapted from a template coming from open air. So I can uh, maybe uh, paste the link uh, on the chat uh, device. So here it is. So it is uh, an adaptation and we had, uh, because we uh, work with a colleague from Sciences Po, Cécile, uh, who is uh, an expert in surveys. She really helped us uh, adapting uh, this uh, template to our needs. So um, I'm sure Cécile will be happy to answer uh, technical questions if uh, necessary after this session. And uh, yes, uh, the, the, the fact that all the partners take the questionnaire at the same time, that is because we created these working groups with at least one person from each university that it was almost compulsory. And this is really important so that each of these persons can refer to experts in their own university and they really have to um, have this questionnaire done by a certain uh, time. Uh, it, we think it is really important and this is what we were talking about before about this collective ambition also. Okay. And then there was the, the question about audit of people who perhaps have mm -hmm. come into this space before a lot of the questions around about open science, open scholarship have appeared. So Helen, I can see you nodding, which I kind of hope. I think that was the question was thinking about the range of researchers, not just young. Yeah. I think I mentioned young early career researchers. Yeah, that was something that came up actually in one of our very early events where we asked a panel of researchers to talk and reflect on their own open science practices. Um, and it was identified that really um, established academics could also do with some um, kind of way of reflecting on their practice. Um, also, they mentioned that they learn a lot from their own um, um, early career researchers, PhD researchers that they might be supervising in this area of work. So I think what we're hoping to do is develop a model where a sort of train the trainer or that we have some ambassadors. Um, so you're, uh, possibly early career researchers that with that, but not neglecting established researchers, um, because we've identified it's ad established researchers can also really get behind open science. Um, but yeah, that, that's something that we're going to do. And with regard to the audit, we're still in the early days of that. One, one of our colleagues is doing that um, at the moment. And again, I hope maybe we can share that um, openly so people can see um, kind of what we've catalogued there. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay, next question I have is for <clears throat> Phil and Tom. So a very specific question about uh, Zooniverse and how you've integrated that into Lancaster Collections. So that one is from Lindsay Gulliver. So I don't know which one of you two might like to have a first crack at that. 
I'm, I'm ha happy to have a go first with, with that one. Um, I mean, I guess that I guess the first thing to say about Zooniverse uh, is that um, integrating it into the platform is very much a it's a long term aspiration um, rather than something that we've uh, we, we've we've already done. And uh, it is um, it's very much aspirational at this this stage. So it's not yet something where we've um, been able to start to engage with the detail. Um, to look at whether that is technically possible even or to you know to kind of understand what that would, would look like and the the Humphrey Davy project that we, we spoke about um, is using Zooniverse but all of the work with Zooniverse is happening outside of the platform and then the the transcriptions from Zooniverse will be basically uh, manually uh, imported into uh, into the platform um, so it's really just an idea at this stage um, but it's something that we would we would love to do um, and would love to work on as part of the, the consortium with mm -hmm. Cambridge Manchester and hopefully others um, you know if, if if that's something of interest to to other institutions I mean it, it, it just feels like there's there's real potential to do something that's more than just a, a platform of images and to you know to almost build a, a kind of research lab in the in the back end of the, of the platform through those those kind of integrations um, Phil, I, I don't know if there's anything further you wanted to come in on on, on that one. No, no, no. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it's it, it is about making um, it more than an image repository, um, uh, but not trying to build all the functionality into one platform. Rather, looking at integrations. Yeah, I, I would have thought. I mean, as a not being a particularly technical person myself, but it looks like a really interesting piece of technology. I would hope that through today, you will actually attract a few other people who may be interested to talk to you about using that, that approach and, and, and see how that might develop within the UK. Um, I've got a question here from William Nixon uh, round about the platform. And I agree, it looks fantastic, your new digital platform, uh, nice and clean, very clear, already draws you in when you were looking at what was there. So a question round about a bit more detail about the technical resources and the funding you needed to, to develop the platform. Um, I can... <laughs> Sorry, Phil, you, you go. Okay, right. Um, so, well, uh, I think we'll probably say the same is that that actually um, uh, we, we have a very small um, technical team uh, at Lancaster. Um, uh, we um, just had a couple of individuals that were working on this from the technical perspective um, as part of a project team that also included um, staff from our other, other library staff. Uh, we benefited hugely from working with Cambridge, and, and I think their aspiration from the start was to was through this partnership to develop something that would mean that other institutions with, with only limited uh, technical support locally will be able to take it on board. And, and that was what was also really interesting for us. It was about going from something that was was designed bespoke to Cambridge to transitioning to that open source, which is where they are now with the. The code base so that um that our, our collective resource um uh, is what will lead to future development in terms in terms of funding it was funded internally um uh, uh within the university it was recognized um as a key priority for the university as well as the library in terms of uh being able to showcase not not just image collections but also some of the great research outputs from the university um so, so that that's that, that was the impetus behind the project uh, as much as anything. Tom, is there anything you wanted to add <clears throat> to that? Um, no, I think that, that covers everything. And, uh, you know, as Phil has said, we've, uh, we already had that, um, that small development team in the library and, you know, they, they've, they've really been the key to, uh, you know, to having the resource to, 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 you know, to get the thing off the ground. I think that's great encouragement to all of us, as you've said, that you've done it, relatively speaking, with a small team, but of course also used a, an open technology to develop that, which fits very nicely into what we're talking about today. <clears throat> so I've got, the next question really is for, I think, probably Helen, Sophie, and possibly Amelie. Um, I did wonder whether we'd get through without uh, mentioning the, the Brexit word and the impact <laughs> of funding. So there's one direct question from Gwen around about um, has Brexit affected UK universities working with European universities and especially on EU funded projects? And I guess I would just add to that, <clears throat> I'm guessing the answer is going to be yes, but it'd be good to get you to reflect. But also then I guess to hear how you'll begin to think if that is going to be the case, are there ways you can mitigate what are you looking at in terms of ongoing collaborations? So perhaps Helen and Sophie first, and then Amelie, you might want to comment on that. Thank you. Yeah, 
I think LSE um, snuck in on Civica Alliance just before Brexit, that's my understanding, or around that time. Um, and I think there has had to be some thinking around LSE's position. But I know Sophie knows more about that, so I'll I'll pass over to you, Sophie. Uh, yeah, well, I, I think, yes, uh, LSE is uh, not part of the Erasmus Plus any longer, but LSE is still part of the H2020 um, projects and maybe Horizon Europe also. So we hopefully, LSE will be part mm -hmm. of the next Civica research project. We really hope uh, that will be the case. And I, I think we all think um, that European projects are so important uh, in these times. So um, really we have to uh, do our utmost uh, to uh, enable LSE to uh, push you, and um, uh, hopefully it will be the case. Fantastic. <clears throat> Emily, did you want to, to comment on, have you had any reflections on the likely changes and challenges we might have with, with some of our European collaborations? Yeah, so, so far um, we haven't been too badly impacted. We, um, in the period of uncertainty, I think the government had, had underwritten all of, all of the European funding anyway, and we there hasn't been anything that we have wanted to apply to that we haven't. My, my slight fear is that as, as things um, progress, it may be more difficult to build those partnerships with, with the UK and, and then there may be things that, that get in the way of bringing, bringing researchers into the UK um, really easily um, in the way that was possible in the, in the past. So I think it could, I, I'm sure that there's a strong will to continue collaborating, um, but I, I fear it, it may become a little more difficult to, to actually bring things to fruition. Okay, thank you very much. Um... So I think we've got, we've got time. We can run over a little bit today, um, colleagues. So I've got time for just a few more questions. Now, there's a question around about resourcing, but I want to leave that to the end because I think that's going to be a question for all of you. So another question for, for Tom and Phil. Can you say a bit more about your future plans for the platform? And I think you have touched a little bit about um, other potential organisations which might get involved, but maybe just say a little bit about what your your next next plans and ambitions are Tom I'll let you take that one first sure um so I I, I think uh you know very much our um next steps are, are probably twofold really so um firstly looking at um on the platform side some of the uh, the technical developments um so you know mentioned things in the presentation around zooniverse for instance um a more immediate priority for us is the integration of the the ohms player um, and that will allow us to be able to uh, to host and manage uh, audiovisual contents and coming out of our um, AHRC funded um, cinema memory project, um, a lot of the outputs from that project are, are basically digitized versions of oral history recordings uh, from the 1990s that are on, on cassette and, and CD. Um, and that's a, that's a more immediate priority for us is to, to have that functionality in the platform so that we can then ingest and, and host um those those types of recordings um so we've uh we, we've got a number of things going on on the the technical side of uh of the platform itself um and then over on the other side it's it's really about looking at the future of the content and the and the collections so um we've got um as we mentioned in the presentation uh, a number of present a number of uh, collections that are, are in the pipeline um, that are, are coming in, um, but also continuing to have a variety of, of conversations, um, you know, with uh, both people in the university who have uh, collections that might have a home on the platform. So, um, particularly colleagues working in digital humanities who are uh, producing uh, as project outputs, um, uh, you know, high quality uh, images that, that that would have potentially, a, a, you know, really a really suitable home in the platform, um, but also uh, the possibility of hosting collections uh, on behalf of others where um, you know they've got the content but they don't necessarily have the resourcing or the or the digital. Uh, expertise and infrastructure to be able to host those collections. So I'll just hand over to, to Phil at this point, uh, in case there's anything, Phil, you wanted to say further about the you know, sort of hosting collections on behalf of others. Yeah, I'll, I'll just um, point to to the comment in the chat from, from Les, Leslie, which I think is very much appreciated. Um, 
um, uh, it's it's our sort of collective vision. I think really is is that um, uh, we could each do this individually, and, and uh, at Lancaster uh, we could host regional collections. But actually, we gain benefits not just by um, uh, working together to develop a tool that is of benefit for us all, but but also through um, joining up um, connect uh, collections really, which you know is very much at the the heart and though of uh, uh, of the ROUK strategy, um, it, it's it's only possible when we work together from the outset to uh, a sort of common goal and make sure that our, we're aligned in that way. And I think um, that that that's the real benefit for us here, as much as having the platform which we're, we're very proud of and and uh, and get great value from it. It's the it's the wider opportunity to connect and, and to deliver something uh, collaboratively. Thank you. Um, and in the context of a discussion we're having about partnerships and partnerships supporting research, I think obviously this is a really great example of how libraries can partner together to support the, the research infrastructure. So thank you. Um, so <clears throat> one quick question before we go on to the, the prioritization one. Um, again, for um, Phil and Tom, just around about the licenses and the question here uh, around about which licenses you apply to your digital collections. If you could try and a really quick one, then yeah, as, open as, possible, as open as possible, um, yeah. wherever possible, uh, the, the most open licenses we can apply. Um, um, uh, certainly, Creative Commons, you know, um, uh, book zero, uh, wherever possible. I think really. I mean, Just briefly, are there? I mean, are there any areas where that's been more challenging? Uh, not with our existing collections, I don't think. Perfect. Okay, colleagues, I'd just like to finish up on a question which is um, part, part of a question which was posed by Liz Waller around about prioritization. And so she asked particularly around about um, academics, speaking to academics and how you decide prioritizations for digitization. But I think listening to all of you, you all work in areas which have enormous possibilities. And I suspect you must all come up against the challenge of resourcing where you prioritize. So I wonder if you might like to all just as we finish up to reflect a bit more broadly about how you make those choices. Uh, and I think the other challenge I would say is that you're all in quite new areas, which makes prioritization even more difficult to decide what to pick. So hopefully that's given you a few pointers to reflect on, but if perhaps uh, Phil and Tom, just if you want to start on the specific question about um, engaging with academics and prioritization of digitization and then thinking more generally about prioritization and me being very aware in the areas of open scholarship. I mean, there are so many choices. So how are you thinking about that prioritization question? So please. Well, I guess a, a lot of how we've um, approached things uh, up to now has been, there's been a, I guess, a fairly organic element to that of, um, you know, developing relationships with, with academics that has then, uh, you know, given rise to, to opportunities uh, where, where some of that has kind of naturally, uh, you know, slotted into place in terms of priorities uh, without too much trouble. Um, I, I think a really key thing for us is um, really looking at our, our strategic priorities as a library and as an institution um, and, and using that as a, you know, as a guide, as a, a, as a you know, a compass for us, so to speak, in terms of, uh, you know, what has the, what has the best fit um, with both the library and the university's strategic priorities um, and, you know, prioritising those things that have the, the kind of stronger strategic fit, the, the stronger potential for, uh, for value and impact um, and, you know, kind of making those a, a priority. Um, Bill, is there anything on that you wanted to come in on? Uh, only that I think, you know, what you say about the the you, the library and university st strategy is key to it really for us um uh, that, that's very much why we tie everything back to the vision that we've got which in itself aligns with the university strategy it keeps us on track um, that's why we have a five-year plan we can't do everything this year but we can sequence things and, and prioritize for the future as well as for today fantastic so Sophie and Helen, from your perspective, um, that really difficult question of choices and prioritisation, anything you'd like to reflect on from your, yeah, your area of work? From LSE, um, I guess what I'd like to say is that, you know, um, 
it's such a huge amount of work to be involved in a funded research project. Um, the amount of deliverables, the documentation, the bureaucracy um, is just huge. So it does it does raise questions of resourcing and prioritisation. Um, it's entirely worth it. Um, and I think what this project's enabled us to do at LSE is think about an area that we would have got to, but we're actually going to get to um, quicker, so open science. So I think what we're hoping to do is really take what we learn um, from the Civic Alliance, but also um, adapt it to LSE. Um, and I expect the other um, institutions um, are doing that. Um, and I think that um, happily, um, open science fits into a couple of the LSE's overall strategic project, uh, strategic aims. So research for the world and also sustaining the social sciences. So it's really been a great um, way to work with other social science institutions to really think about open science from that social science perspective. So, yeah, I think that it's it's really uh, being involved in this project, I suppose, has made sure that we're reprioritizing um, within LSE Library and making sure that we 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 make the most of this and build open science um, at LSE as much as we can. Thank you. Sophie, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, well, I, I think, Helen, you covered everything. Maybe mm -hmm. um, something totally different is that I, I think we all agree to prioritize all actions that would enable us to address specificities in our disciplines. Mm -hmm. So I think we currently lack expertise on how best to share data in specific disciplines, which can vary um, enormously uh, from one discipline to, to another. So I, I think we are in the process of uh, prioritizing all the actions uh, which would bring more expertise in these uh, fields. Thank you. And then, Emily, over to you. I mean, I couldn't help notice when you showed your love, your fantastic project list, but what a broad scope of things were included within that. Um, so you must face that question about what you pick and choose. Yeah, and it, it's really tricky because you can do a certain amount of strategic thinking with research funding because you know that there are certain open calls that you can apply to at any time and certain things that will come up regularly, but there are a lot of things that you can't predict. Um, so I think it's all, always sort of three things that are jostling together when we're deciding whether we're going to go for something um, or not, go for an application or not. It will be how well does whatever it is align with strategic priorities, but there'll, there'll also be a very um, real question about capacity. Um, so so, so if, it, if it won't bring in new resource, can we do it within our existing resource? Even if it will bring in new resource, have we got the space? Um, have we got the IT equipment? Um, have we got the HR capacity to recruit the new posts? And then also the likelihood of success. So if something wasn't a top priority, but we thought actually we think we've got a really good chance of getting this, then, then things would sh might shift and, and we would apply, even, even though you could argue that there was something more urgent that we want to do, but there's no opportunity to fund it. So it, it's, it's very tricky. You have to kind of balance those three elements as best you can. Fantastic. 